Welcome, everyone, to the Conversations That Matter podcast. I'm your host, John Harris, to have a conversation today with Pastor Michael Selecki. Pastor Mike, thank you for joining me. I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you for having me, John. And, and we were just uh, together in New Mexico. You're the pastor of Redemption Hill Church. And if people want to find out more, they go to Redemption Hill, uh, New Mexico. It's just nm.org, redemptionhillnm.org. And your sermons are there and everything else. And if you're in uh, that area, I would suggest uh, in Albuquerque, check out the church. And um, and, and you, it was a delight being there. So, you know, thank you for that time. And uh, yeah. I'll have to come back and do dirt biking with you at some point. Yeah, absolutely. We would love it. So it's too windy. I would love it personally. You would, yeah. Well, I, I would love it too. I've never done it. So, um, so, so here's uh, why you're on, just so everyone knows what we're going to talk about. Uh, Calvary Chapel is a denomination I really haven't talked about. And people who follow this podcast, as you, I, I know, uh, know this, they, they know that I talk about compromises in evangelical circles in Christianity mostly along the line of social justice, which would include the LGBT stuff. And um, Calvary, in my mind, like I always associate them with good things, right? Like they were the ones that before John MacArthur ever opened his church, they were on the beach doing services during COVID in California. Mm. Um, they're people of the Bible, you know, verse by verse, Chuck Smith, uh, you know, I, I associate him like with, with uh, just solid Bible teaching for the most part. Like if you ask a Calvary Chapel pastor, what to do about something, they're going to open their Bibles up. Like that's, that's yeah. what I think of when I think of Calvary Chapel. And it, it's concerning to me that, um, and you kind of were the first one to notify me that this was going on, that they're adopting some, not broadly perhaps, but in certain churches and in certain, I guess, one of the denominations associated with them or associations, this some kind of gay celibate theology. And and I guess that's my first question for you, because you you were a Calvary Chapel pastor for years and, and you were trained in in uh, through Calvary. Like, like, how did that happen that they went from? Well, I'm not saying they're all bad or anything. Right. There's good things right. there. But like, how does that happen with churches in a network like that that are known for being Bible teaching? Right. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I mean, to be honest, I I never would have thought that. Uh, this adoption of gay celibate theology uh, would come into a, a Calvary. I just, I wouldn't have expected that at all. Um, I love Calvary's. I mean, that's where I, I cut my teeth uh, and I'm so thankful for, for Calvary Albuquerque uh, and, and even pastor skip answering the call to come to Albuquerque uh, way back in the eighties and to uh, start teaching the Bible. And the Lord just did a tremendous work and, I was able to, I got saved and, and I started going to a church that wasn't really good theologically when I first got saved, but in a short order of time, just in a couple of months, uh, God pulled me out of that and planted me right in uh, Calvary, Albuquerque. And I sat under Pastor Skip and just saw it honestly. I mean, just one of the best Bible teachers in the nation, just verse by verse through, through the scriptures, love it, and just started to grow. So many solid believers. So to see um, an adoption towards gay celibate theology, um, that it's, so it's okay. You can be gay as long as you just don't act, uh, in, in an action, engage in homosexual activity. Uh, it, it's okay to be gay and a Christian uh, is essentially what gay celibate theology teaches. Or, um, you might've heard for those, maybe listening, if you're not familiar with, uh, uh, maybe a distinction between side A Christianity or side B Christianity, side A Christianity when it comes to homosexuality has to do with those that affirm gay marriage. So they just straight up, I think any conservative Christian would look at it and go, we disagree with them. That is right. not traditional a view of marriage scripturally. Uh, that no way the Bible affirms homosexual marriage. So side A is we believe you can be uh, uh, a homosexual who in, gets married and remains in a monogamous homosexual marriage, and the Bible's okay with that. I think everyone would readily see, go, that's that's not what the Bible teaches. Side B, on the other hand, uh, it comes off like they adhere to an orthodox understanding of marriage, a traditional biblical view of marriage, 
And as you work your way through, uh, it, it seems like it. They say, we believe that marriage is between one man, one woman. That's how God designed it. I agree with that. That is exactly what the Bible teaches. As you continue to get deeper, they'll say, um, it, we believe that you that being gay is not a morally culpable sin in and of itself. That that same same sex orientation or same sex attraction is is not a sin, and so that's not something that you have to repent of. Uh, that's not something uh, that needs to be changed or transformed. There's some sort of like holy good way that you could you can live that out. You just cannot engage in homosexual activity, but the attraction, the orientation itself is not a sin. And that's where it departs from an orthodox view of, of sexuality and the way God created us as image bearers. And it, it undermines the doctrine of sin. It undermines what the Bible has to say about indwelling sin and the flesh. And so at the end of the day, it ends up undermining how you go about making disciples, doing evangelism, and encouraging people to grow in sanctification with their own walk with the Lord. Well, we'll get into more broadly the different associations in, in Calvary and uh, and also, I guess, Preston Sprinkle and, yeah. and what he's been doing at a Calvary church in Boise. But um, I, I want to maybe hear your story or, or have the listeners here, sure. um, because Part of what contributed to you becoming an independent Bible church, which is, I understand you're not with a denomination. Is that correct? Correct. Is it, you were with Calvary though, is, is over this issue. Yes. Um, yeah. So why don't you like, just let people know kind of like, this was serious enough for you to actually leave. Uh, what happened? What, what transpired that made you think like, okay, I, I can't really be part of Calvary Chapel because of this issue. Sure. Sure. I, I still think, I mean, in my mind, I think uh, there's a large majority, vast majority of, of Calvary's that one, they might not even be aware uh, that this is is happening in some of the uh, the Calvary's. Um, they, I, I don't think, I think that most Calvary chapel guys, if they were to, to just read, um, read about gay celibate theology or pick up like Greg Cole's book, Single Gay Christian, you'd read it and go, uh, this is not something uh, to be embraced or had, but it is coming in uh, to certain uh, Cal Calvaries. And just, I guess, to be clear, Calvary never considers itself a denomination, but in some ways, uh, after being around so long, it's, it, it's, it's, it's a, a flavor of of Christianity, how, no matter how you want to well, slice it's, it. It's an, an association, I guess, but they, yes. like, like hierarchy is kind of inevitable. I, I noticed this it just is, in is. like Bible believing churches where they have the conference circuit that they like to go to. Right. And it's like, they look up to those guys. Like there, there sort of ends up being like a, right. a somewhat of an influence coming down, yeah. but so, yeah, so and, sure. Yeah. And, and, and there's, and so then there's like the Calvary chapel distinctives and uh, there's some core, like, doctrines that Calvary guys, you have to adhere to. Uh, like there's a doctrinal statement when you're going to affiliate to be a Calvary uh, pastor, you fill out, uh, you know, where you stand on, on doctrines, on, on salvation, justification, eschatology, things like that. Um, so that, that they want to make sure, do you adhere to these core beliefs? Uh, and, and are you um, going to be in line with the Calvary chapel? Uh, distinctives. And then there was maybe uh, going back to when Chuck Smith passed away, um, uh, Calvary Chapel was all one affiliation. Then after Chuck Smith passed away, his son-in-law, Brian Broderson, took over uh, Calvary Chapel Costa Mesa. And, and within a short amount of time, it became clear that he was moving in a different direction than where Chuck Smith was moving. And uh, the, the way the distinctives would hedge things in and how he would go about affiliating different churches or different pastors that wanted to be Calvary pastors. Uh, that caused some of the, the, the older uh, Calvary Chapel pastors that were directly like were discipled under Chuck Smith to go, hey, this is moving in a wrong direction. So they, they created the Calvary Chapel Association. So there's Calvary Chapel Global Network 
That's under Brian Broderson. And, and I've always seen the Calvary Chapel Global Network as something that's, they're a little bit looser with some of their the theological stances when it comes to people affiliating. So uh, w- without those distinctives being there, it's going to allow, I think, for, um, it, it allows for greater people to join, but the unity right. on core issues is going to be gone. So Calvary Chapel Association was established to say, no, we're trying to stay tr- tried and true to the original vision. So when I right. did eventually affiliate, uh, you know, I, I, growing up in Calvary's come out of Calvary when we did this church plant, when it came time to do uh, the affiliation, we affiliated with Calvary Chapel Association, uh, you know, based on that. I, I looked at Calvary Chapel Association as like, they're going down a more tried and true path, and there seems to be a stronger clarity of direction as to where we're moving as a brotherhood of affiliated churches uh, going forward. Okay, so, and, and, and I, just a little uh, aside, you, you mentioned Calvary Global Network, and um, when I was looking up online, I didn't do a lot of research. I really just did like a search engine just to see, hey, where does Calvary Chapel on same-sex attraction and homosexuality? And um, this is one of the first articles that came up by David Guzik, and it's from 2015. But he basically, he says a homosexual can be a Christian in right standing with God if by homosexual you mean one who is attracted to people of their same gender. So mm-hmm. as long as you're not acting on it, just as you said, that's that gay celibate theology. And then you just mentioned uh, Brian Broder, uh, Broderson. And, you know, he in 2015, this is long before Alistair Begg was saying similar things, I suppose. But uh, he says that you should uh, consider uh, going to a same sex wedding if that would um, be something that the Lord could use in the life of your friend or relative or, you know, unbeliever. So um, it's just like, I, I, what I, if I didn't know that there were two Calvary Chapel networks, I would have thought like, okay, so they've just compromised. But like, this is only one association. Right. But the association that you were in, that you, you ended up leaving, though, wasn't this one. Right. You, you left uh, the more solid one. Right. So even over the same thing. So explain that maybe. <laughs> yeah. So, I, I mean, I could start to see um, uh, the conversation when it came to homosexuality in the evangelical church. A lot of talk was happening about same sex attraction and then whether or not that was actually sin. And so even even before um, what what led to me parting ways with Calvary Chapel, I started looking into like, what is this, what is this argument about? Like what, what is being said here? And and essentially what's being said is that, that a same sex attraction is, is not sin. Uh, You know, that, that it's, it's not something you would need to repent of. It's not something that you would need to, uh, go before the Lord and and ask Him help with, but the orientation itself is just fine, and that's where I, I began to see. I think uh, the razor's edge, if it were, uh, between this, this was at Skip Isaac's church then. Just no, so this this was, this, this, was this was just this was just me studying in general. This was just uh, okay. just me studying in general about the issue. So I had started to looking at it, going, um, do. Uh, does the Bible, it's like the, the Bible clearly says same sex attraction is sin. Like we're desiring things or I'm attracted to things that are off limits that God has clearly made off limits. And those attractions would be there as a direct result of the fall. Um, God did not create humanity to be same sex attracted. And uh, just because I desire something in my heart, uh, just because I desire it, or even if it feels natural, doesn't mean that that's right. I have, I'm, I'm attracted to things that are not good uh, just because of my sinful nature. And the Bible only gives one remedy for the flesh and the sin nature, and that's the cross. We're to crucify the flesh and all of its sinful passions. So in my mind, it just became clear, uh, same-sex attraction is sin, but they want to differentiate between same-sex attraction and and full-blown you know lust and behavior and 
I, I don't see a distinction at all in scripture uh, about that whatsoever. Um, if we if we just are we desiring things that are evil and wrong, that's it's right. evil and wrong. So we need to repent of it right then and there. When it came in Cal into to Calvary, the first time I noticed it was uh, two years ago, and we were teaching through Leviticus, and we're just teaching book by book, chapter by chapter, verse by verse. That's that's really kind of the Calvary mo, and so I could soon see. Uh, that in May, when it comes to June, we're going to be in Leviticus 18 during, you know, uh, the world's uh, celebration Pride of yeah. Pride Month. Yeah. And so <laughs> I was like, OK, Lord, I guess this is where we're going. And then I got word that Calvary Albuquerque had invited uh, Greg Coles to come and speak at the church and that he had wrote a book called Single Gay Christian. This is the first time. I'm being introduced to, to Greg Coles. Well, when you hear it, I hear single gay Christian and uh, I go, well, that's, you know, it raises a red flag just with the title, but sometimes it's like, well, titles of books can be uh, just written that way. To, yeah. It's a hook. Okay. Let me read it. And then you read the inside and it's going to be okay. So I thought well, maybe it's something like that, but we want to go ahead and, and, and look like, let's just check out, uh, my wife says, well, I'm going to check out his Instagram page and see what this guy's all about. And as right. soon as you look at his Instagram page, it just becomes very clear. This is not a guy you should have come uh, teach at your church. Right. I mean, he's, he talks about celebrating Pride Month. Uh, he's got some other stuff about, you know, a gay church hunt, this like diagram that you're supposed to follow for for gay people to find the right church and and make sure that they're affirming of your sexual orientation. You look at this stuff and it's completely off base. That leads me the following day because Greg Cole, so I found out about that on Sunday, the following day on a Monday, uh, I'm going to reach out. I knew, um, I, I knew one of the pastors there. I just reached out via text message and expressed my concerns that this guy, Greg Coles, is coming. I know he's going to be teaching there Wednesday night. Um, I don't think he's a guy you should have. Now, pushback had already been happening within Calvary, Albuquerque, for, for weeks. I happened to just find out about it um, the Sunday before he was coming uh, to speak. And the word I got back, I think, after several pushback is they decided not to have him come, which was good. I thought, okay, they're not going to have him come. Uh, this thing's over. They were going to have another pastor teach on homosexuality and what the Bible says about homosexuality, just to clear things up. Because I, I think for years they've been teaching people to be Bereans. So when this comes up and they knew that this speaker's coming, he wrote this book and people looked inside of single gay Christian and saw what it said. Uh, they had people rightly pushing back, going, why are we bringing uh, the speaker? Right. And so so they decided not to have him come. But that Wednesday evening, when I decide I decide I don't normally watch like their services online, but I said, well, I'm going to watch. I want to I want to hear what they have to say. So um, uh, Pastor Nelson uh, Walker was going to teach on homosexuality that night. And um, uh, uh, Nate Heitzig. Uh, who's an executive pastor there, before before Nelson teaches, he says, hey, Greg Coles is not going to be here, but we still have his book in the bookstore, and it's the best, most biblical book, you know, on the subject. I encourage everyone to go and buy it. Oh. <laughs> and so, Oops. so that, yeah, so that that is what kind of led me that Saturday, um, well, that Thursday, I said, well, I'm going to buy a copy of this book uh, and read it. In fact, well, I didn't buy it. I actually checked out a, a digital copy uh, from the library, read it that day, and, um, and and I read it cover to cover. And it's just there's some blatant, like glaring problems. Yeah, I've read it. Yeah. Just glaring, glaring problems. Um, and in, in light of that, uh, I said, well, look, at if this is being promoted publicly, Calvary Chapel, uh, New Mexico, is the regional overseeing church for the affiliated churches in this region. So this is 
this is my overseeing church that's promoting this guy and and saying this book is the best most biblical book on, on the issue and and i love I, I mean i do i sincerely do love all these guys and um uh, they've played made in major impacts in my own own life but i i'm like false teachings false teaching yeah you know it's just very 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 clear and so and that book just so people know it, it does promote uh i think in a sort of s- subversive way gay marriage because he says it does. like you you talked about the distinction between side a and side b and i'm like i read that book and i thought i don't know if this guy is gonna like gonna be side a or he's almost side a or where he's at because right. he's he's was open to same-sex marriage at the end of the book and uh, even said that uh, there's other issues like i think he said free will and predestination and yes. like eschatology maybe there's other stuff that he's like well these yeah. these issues are um like of, of greater importance you know and i'm like what are you talking about you know right. this, it's like we're talking about like basic creation like god right. created male and female and we're gonna right. so um so, so yeah I, I was pretty surprised when i read that that there were people but but you know what like we that's a warning to even me like we can all there's deception that can happen when we want to believe something when, right. Sure. So that's why we need correction. And that's what it sounds like you tried to do and you went through the proper channels, but you, you weren't really uh, taken seriously or at least not seriously right. enough to change yeah. direction. Yeah. And so that, that Sunday I, I spoke openly about what was happening. I figured this is being endorsed publicly uh, from Calvary, New Mexico. I want to share uh, with the flock uh, that the Lord's entrusted to, to my care to shepherd. And I just see this, this is, this is just false doctrine. And, and I'm not trying to encourage anyone to like go rile up and just start making nasty calls to right. Calvary right. Chapel, but just to be praying. But here's what, here is what this bro, uh, book teaches. Um, it, it becomes like, I'll, I'll share just to, just to read a quote from the book so people can hear just very clearly what it has to say Uh, in chapter chapter four, uh, which is a chapter entitled what God called good. uh, He, he writes, uh, Greg Coles does about his own same sex orientation. He says, is it possible? I, I finally dared to ask myself that homosexuality isn't merely a disordered form of heterosexuality. That instead, every sexual orientation, and right away I go, every sexual orientation, every sexual orientation after the fall is a disordered form of the original sexuality that God had intended it to be. And you jump just another paragraph down. He says, is it too dangerous, too unorthodox to believe that I am uniquely designed to reflect the glory of God, that my orientation, mind you, he's saying I'm same sex oriented, I'm a gay Christian, that my orientation before the fall was meant to be a gift in appreciating the beauty of my own sex as I celebrate the friendship of the opposite sex, that perhaps even within God's flawless original design, there might have been eunuchs, people called to live lives of holy singleness. And so this happens quite a bit within gay celibate theology is to to lump same-sex orientation into like a category of a eunuch. And and then it says, we recoil from the word gay, from the very notion of same-sex orientation, because we know what it looks like only outside of Eden. And I mean, I would pause there and go, um, it's only existed outside of Eden. (laughs) It never existed in Eden. That's right. And he says- We only notice it outside of Eden where everything's gone wrong. But what if there's goodness hiding in the ruins? What if the calling to gay Christian celibacy is more than just a failure of straightness? What if God dreamed it for me, wove it into the fabric of my being as he knit me together and sang me into life? This is this is a problem because we're we're no longer uh, encouraging people like uh, in, in first Corinthians six, where he says, hey, you know, uh, don't you know that neither drunkard nor reviler nor uh, immoral nor homosexual inherit the kingdom of God? 
And he says, and such were some of you. Like yeah. you were this past tense, but God has washed you. He's cleansed you. He's sanctified you uh, in, in Christ. And so to have to hold on to an identity uh, that is mutually exclusive with Christianity is a problem because your identity is going to drive the direction you're going to move and walk in. I always liken it to like if you were a Marine and you're in combat. I mean, once you sign up, you, you're a soldier, you're enlisted, you're a Marine. And so the, your motto is Semper Fi, always faithful. You're not going to leave a, a brother behind. Well, in combat, I mean, there might be gunfire. If my brother gets shot, you're like, I don't want to leave him behind. But you're scared. You're panicked. Everything in you is telling you, oh, I don't know, just up and leave. But you tell yourself, Semper Fi. I'm a Marine, Semper Fi. Well, my identity is driving me to go in a direction that is contrary to where my cowardice is lying so mm -hmm. that I would go and get my brother and move out. The second you say, well, you know, I'm just I'm just a civilian. I'm not really a Marine. Uh, I, I still am a civilian, so I can I can walk away. You try to hold on to both of those identities at the same time. It becomes a problem and it's not going to help you move towards the real sanctification that the Lord has for you. And at the end of the day, I think that's where a big problem with gay celibate theology is, is it's a truncated gospel that actually leaves uh, someone like, like Greg Coles or anyone else who would be struggling with like same sex desires in a place of hopelessness because uh, gay celibate theology teaches that same sex attraction is, is it's an unchangeable part of who well, you are. He, he just baked it into creation. He just said, yeah. God designed me. So, so like, that's, if that's the design, then like, that's, that's the blueprint. Like, right. um, it, 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 and it strikes me as interesting. He said multiple, uh, well, he used the plural, right. For orientations. Right. And, you know, I, I wonder, I, I mean, some people don't like this, but whenever I hear these arguments, I always wonder like, well, what if you put like pedophilia in, like swapped out the word right. and it's, I'm not saying they're the same thing they're the same action, but I'm just saying like, is would the principle still apply? Would this be a good argument for pedophilia? Like, I'm not going to act on it, but it's like right. this hidden beauty that God wove into me. And maybe it's the reason that I'm, I have friendships with children, right? Like he, right. you'd say everything he just said and, right. and we would all reject it. We would all run for the Hills and say like this, like <laughs> lock this guy up. Maybe no, <laughs> like, right. like, like we're going to keep an eye on him. Like, but as soon as you say it about a popular sin that the world wants to celebrate, like th there's a, a, a tremendous amount of pressure to accept that. And, and right. so, um, so no, I appreciate that explanation. And I, I thought maybe what would be good, uh, cause I want to talk about Preston Sprinkle a little bit is as a pastor, since you've, you've, uh, had to deal with this issue, maybe we could play some clips, um, I, I thought maybe first one from Calvary Global Network and uh, just because cause they're really like on board with this, it seems like based on their website. And then um, uh, and then Preston Sprinkle, it, he's part of the other association, the one that you were part of, or at least a church in that association. And I have an interview queued on that. So um, if, if you want to share more, we can keep talking. But I thought maybe that would be a good thing for, for you to just like bring your pastoral uh, expertise and, and refute kind of what's being taught out there. Sure. Sure. Yeah. I, I mean, I, the only thing I would, I, I would say is, um, you know, there was back and forth about three, three in-person meetings with Calvary, New Mexico. I had just trying to, I mean, pointing out things just like this in the book that I'm asking, Hey, does, uh, does, does Calvary New Mexico believe that single gay Christian is a good book that's filled with good teaching that's beneficial for the body of Christ? Right. And um, I, I couldn't get a, an answer. Um, the, at, at the at the end, uh, the answer that I got back uh, w with my final meeting that I did meet, I did meet with with Skip. And the final answer that he gave me was uh, he believes it's one person's narrative and they decided not to to act on that inclination. And so he believes that that's a win. And I, I just, I, I don't think it's one, not, it's not really answering the question. And two, 
um, it's not a win because at the end of the day, it's introducing some concepts that are are problematic. And so in, in talking with Calvary Albuquerque, I also brought this up to, to the Calvary Chapel Association just to find out like, where does the association stand uh, on this particular issue? And the answer that I, I finally got back with after back and forth there was, uh, they believe that this is a social issue and that every Calvary is free to choose um, how they want to engage with this. I see. And so so upon from hearing from the, the, the leadership council that that's where they stood on it, that's what ultimately made me choose. Well, I don't think, you know, for, you know, this is this is. Uh, I don't think I can no longer be affiliated with Calvary Chapel Association. Now, I, I do know that uh, there's, I mean, I think there's there's plenty of Calvaries that m might even know like, hey, there's, there's stuff that's happening, but we think that this is good and hopefully they're hoping for change uh, to happen. I think there's a ton of great things that are still happening in Calvary uh, and, and reasons that people would want to choose to stay affiliated. For me, just at working my way there, I thought, Oh, I don't think this is for me. And part of the reason, even uh, just a, agreeing to do the podcast with you, a question I asked myself was, well, if I was another Calvary chapel uh, somewhere else in another state and the same situation happened and they got word back from the association that they believe it's just a, a social issue and any Calvary can choose to deal with it as they want, would I want to know about it? And uh the answer is I, I would want to know about it. I would want to know about it if I was joining. I would want to know about it if I had stayed in. And, and people can choose to do what they want to do or if they want to address that. It is going to be an issue that has to be addressed uh, eventually. I, I think people are wondering who are in Calvary, is this a policy? Is this in writing? Is this word of mouth? Like, what, is, This is an email that I got back. From the and uh, they, be they believe that the distinctives are enough to hedge in. Uh, what needs to be hedged in, and um, and I think obvious in my in my opinion, it's not because this is obviously coming in, and for me, without the clarity of language as to where where is Calvary going to stand on this issue, it's going to be very hard to keep unity uh, moving forward. Uh, where where does Calvary stand on this? And and the, the other people should know. Look at I. I don't think everyone on and the, even the leadership council of Calvary Chapel Association even agrees with it. Just the way the association works is, uh, from my understanding, the association for them to change anything or do anything, all 11 council members have to be in 100% agreement to make a change. So even if 10 council members decided, hey, we should do something about this, we should we should write some clarifying doctrinal statements. If one of them says no, I don't think we need to. Uh, this is the direction. Like we're okay with just the distinctives as is. Then nothing is going to change. And so it, this getting brought up, like honestly, my best read would be: well, all the council mem members heard about it, but if one person decided not to do anything, well, then by default, you're going to have to say we we think it's a a social issue, and every church can just deal with it. Yeah, that as must they have want. been tough for you. I mean, I, I can't imagine having that. That was your spiritual network. That's where you cut your teeth, learning how to study and preach the Bible. And now there's a rift there, you know, like, I, I just, I don't know, my heart goes out to people that, that you did the right thing, right? But it probably felt in the moment. And, and for people listening, who might right. be in a similar predicament, where they just like, they know the right thing, but it's like, right. oh, this cost is going to be so high, it's going to hurt. Right. Um, you're, you're okay. I just, I guess I just want to get that out there. Yeah. Like you, 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 I mean, I, I'm sure that it still hurts in some ways, but like, sure. You, you have a thriving church. Sure. You, you're the people there are happy and growing and, and you came out the other side of this following the Lord and the Lord rewarded you for it. Like you weren't just abandoned by your spiritual network. You, you still have a spiritual network. Yeah. So. Yeah, absolutely. And, and to let people know too, the, there are other, I do know of other Calvaries in this area when the issue got a, a, a rose up and they found out about it. There were other Calvaries that personally wrote Calvary, New Mexico, too, 
okay. uh, to say, hey, what what's what's going on here? So, but it kind of stays contained, I think, at least just to this region. Um, I don't think anyone really knows that um, Calvary Chapel Association, at least in me pursuing and trying to find out, well, where do we stand on this issue that they landed? It's just a social issue and yeah. Calvary's are free to, to choose what they want to do with it. And so at the end of the day, like I, I do love Calvary's, but it was a, in my mind, this is a deal breaker. If we if we can't figure out, you know, this issue, it's only going to lead to mm -hmm. further liberalization uh, within the church. Like if, if we can't square this away, it's going to be a problem. Well, Skip Heisek's kind of a big name too. I mean, it's, it's not just, like it is local, but it's also like, yeah, that's a pretty influential church just in the whole movement. I, right. as I understand it. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Skip is, and, and the Lord has used them just in a, a tremendous way. And so I think for me, I was really taken back because I thought ah, there's, I mean, for 14 years trained and discipled there, ministry school there. I never for the life of me would have even thought that, uh, something like this, uh, th their bookstores always, they've always tried to do a good job, even vetting yeah. out books, like which books we'll have. And, and yeah. e even in the, for, so early on in the Calvary Chapel days, um, vineyard movement branched out. It was a branch off of Calvary. Right. For John Wimber, uh, he's wanted to emphasize signs and wonders and pursuing like experiences with the spirit over this, the word of God. And Chuck Smith said, you can't, basically, that's where some of the distinctives start hedging in too. It's like, you can't be, a, if you're going to do that, you can't be a Calvary. Our right. focus is going to be on, on the word of God, you know, and any experience with this, the, the Holy Spirit has to be in submission to what the scriptures say. We're going to emphasize the word. And so if you're going to do this, you, you don't, don't be a Calvary chapel. Don't call yourself a Calvary chapel. And that's, I think we're at a spot, even on an issue that's more important, where it's like, if you're going to embrace this theology, yeah. um, then just don't call yourself a, a Calvary. Yeah. You know, this is the direction we're going to go. And we're going to be united on this. We're not going to say it. you can be gay and a Christian. Um, yeah, yeah. It, it's like you wonder, and it's all speculative. So I, I you know, I don't want to say one way or the other, but like, you know, if Chuck Smith were still around, I know people are saying the same thing about because uh, crew is like in turmoil over this same issue right now. Right. Um, you know, and, uh, you know, they ask the same questions. Like if if the people, the founding generation was still around, like some, some of the old timers will, will say like, oh, they never would have put up with this. Right. Right. But it's it's like, yeah, I guess that's a, a cycle that uh not just churches, but businesses and other things go through, right? Like you, you have these, you know, solid founders that are put in the work and stuff. And, and, and then, you know, we have such a blessing that's passed down to us. We, we have this great institution right. that's preaching the Bible and teaching right. and, and we take it for granted, but, but it could go away. It could go away very quickly if we don't defend it, if we don't right. defend the truth. And that's the lesson I think in the, in, in your passion. So, um, so yeah, thank you for, for sharing that with everyone. And, and I, I do know that there are listeners in, in Calvary who, uh, they listen to this podcast. They have the same concerns. They're, they're solid. They're trying to make sure yeah, those things yeah. don't come into their churches. And, oh yeah. Uh, I mean, honestly, if I, if it was me and I was moved somewhere else and I was looking for a church, I would be looking right away. I go, well, where's the local Calvary in this area? That's yeah. just, I would still be doing that. I would go, well, where's the Calvary? I think uh, this is good. Now, if I started finding out, okay, there's they're starting to buy into some of these uh, social justice uh, issues, um, especially with gay celibate theology, I go, oh, I, yeah. I th I'm deal out. Breaker. Yeah, it's a deal breaker. So let me, so we, we've been going about 39 minutes. Um, let, let me do this uh, because I want to talk a little bit about Preston Sprinkle and uh and I don't know how much time we want to give to, I, I have two videos queued up. I know you watched them both, but the first is an interview that was posted, I think like two years ago. It, it wasn't that long ago on uh, Calvary uh, Global Network, their website, right? So they're the ones that are pushing this more. They don't just let churches decide. Well, I guess they, maybe they do, but they're, they're like very out front on their website. This is what we believe. 
and it's gay celibate theology. So uh, you can tell me to stop whenever you want, or we could just play through the clip. But th sure. this is what this is an example of what you were talking about, Pastor Mike, uh, with that theology for people who don't know. Someone we're doing like a, a difficult topic series or whatever at our church, and they're talking about all the, you know, weird you know, politics and LGBTQ. And so that night, I was like, so stressed out about like, man, what are they going to say? And like, are people looking at me? And like, do people know? And, and the conversation, the, the sermon that the guy preached, he talked about the difference between temptation and actions. And that was the first time in my entire life that I'd ever heard someone say, like, you can be attracted to the same sex and still live in accordance to God's will hmm. if you choose not to act on it. And so for me, that was like a breath of fresh air, but then it was also maybe, a maybe new thing. Right like, okay. Okay. Now I go for it. I, I, this is, I think the common thing that you'll hear uh, again and again, when it comes to side B or gay celibate theology is that uh, uh, you, you, you can have these attractions, but as long as you don't act on it, um, you're okay. And what ends up happening is, is it completely removes what the Bible has to say about our sin nature in the flesh. And so for, for Jesus, when he says, hey, it's not what, it's not what comes on the outside uh, that defiles you. It's what's on the inside that defiles you. Um, All right. And so, so then he, he goes on and he goes on to define what that is. He's like evil thoughts, adulteries, like just evil thoughts, thinking things that are, are contrary to God's goodness, God's holiness, the way that God would have to, those evil thoughts. They're, they're, they're something that defiles us from within. And then even in Galatians, where we're, we're commanded to walk in the spirit and to put to deed, put to death. Uh, the works of the flesh, it's the same thing. It's like you're to crucify the flesh and it's, it's evil passions and desires. And so uh, this side of the fall, you and I, we, we have to, we're engaging in spiritual battle all the time. There are things that arise up from our sin nature that are no longer to define who we are because we've been made new in Christ. And if I'm in Christ and I'm identified with his death, burial, and resurrection, I'm supposed to start taking every thought captive mm -hmm. and bring it to the obedience of Christ. So the second you start saying well, same-sex attraction is okay, uh, it's not a sin, you can just allow it to be there, you're, 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 you're starting off on the wrong foot. Mm -hmm. You're making it so that these people, anyone who's struggling with this sin, with with this desire or attraction, you're telling her it's okay. You don't have to engage in battle at this level. Only once it starts to become like an action, or if you really start to think, you know, you're really lusting this way. And right. so I, 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 I would say if I had some attraction, just to your point, John, if you put it in a different context, like, well, I'm a minor attractive person <laughs> and I'm, I'm attracted to, you know, if, if someone said, well, I'm attracted to little kids, we Ooh. would go, this is crazy. You the, perish the thought. Yes. Put, put that thought instantly to the cross. Say, Lord, why did that even cross my mind? That's, that's not right. And it, it, maybe it, it just rose up in you. The thing is, is our flesh can, it can produce evil thoughts, evil things like that. What am I supposed to do? I'm supposed to take it captive and bring it to the obedience of Christ. But we're trying to normalize um, same sex attraction and, and homosexuality and LBGTQ issues as a, a normal category of, of personhood mm. that's to be accepted. And I, and I think all this stuff comes off as a, a means it's from what I can see from Preston Sprinkle and Greg Cole, it's like the church has been doing things wrong for 2000 years. Um, they don't know how to treat, I mean, multiple times in single gay Christian, Greg Cole's refers to himself as a sexual minority. That's and, right. yeah. and so it's the church that's been oppressing minorities. And um, uh, he'll even go on to say, well, I, 
I call myself gay, but that's not, you know, that's the best way to describe what I'm dealing with. So he doesn't want to surrender that. He thinks it's, it's okay, but I'm still a Christian and it's fine. It's not primarily what defines him, but he ends up showing his hand when he starts talking about how he's at a prayer meeting and back at the Obergefell decision, someone comes in whom he'd started to know and like, he talks about this in the book and they want to pray like, Hey, there's this, this, this evil LBGTQ agenda that the Supreme court is dealing with. And we need to be praying against this, that this wouldn't come into our country. Right. And even while you're reading the book, he's like, he started to tremble. His, he said he clenched his fists and he just thought about how every person like him that's just trying to live out their natural feelings, they would feel so attacked by just someone praying this way. And I go, so what the church, is, like we can't pray against evil or evil agendas. This yeah. it's so it, there's this like, this, the push, I think, comes from like the church. We're going to teach you the new, loving, compassionate way to really help LBGTQ people. And if they have this orientation, that's fine, just as long as they don't act on it. And this is what the church needs to accept. And I would just say it's starting off on the wrong foundation. We, we ought not to accept it. We ought to reject it outright. And, and anyone who's turning to Christ, anyone who's repenting, and turning to him, their identity needs to be wholly anchored in in him. Good word. Yeah, this is, uh, I, I forgot to say the name. This is Brenna Blaine, by the way, you're listening to the voice mm -hmm. uh, here on uh, a guest on the podcast called the Good Lion Podcast uh, that's put out by uh, Calvary Chapel Global Network. I have to decide, am I going to live this lifestyle that the world is telling me will make me happy? Or do I live this other lifestyle that is in accordance with my faith? And as I wrestled with that, that was like from age 16 to 17, it changed from this lifestyle according to my faith to a lifestyle that I know will give me peace. You know, I would say, do we believe being homosexual is a sin? Like I would say, I don't believe it is because I can't find any biblical arguments calling Christians to be straight. But I do see biblical arguments calling us to be radically obedient towards Christ. And then that means if we are engaging in sex by the sexual ethic that God has given to us. There, I should probably stop there because yeah. I've yeah. heard that before where people, they'll phrase it like, God doesn't call you to be heterosexual, he calls you to be holy or something like that. Right. You know? Yeah. I, I, and and uh, yeah, it, there's in their mind, it's like, well, I'm, I'm wired this way in a, in a almost, I, you get contradictory statements, but it's like, this is a, a mutable part of who I am. Mm -hmm. And maybe I was called, maybe the way I was created is I was a, a holy unit called to singleness. And so that's where these desires are. And, and being same sex attracted allows me to, to build unique friendships with other people that can be compassionate and helpful. Uh, but if I'm just attracted this way, it's not out of step with with who God really made me. There's some sort of like holy way I could I can live this out. And I would just say all of us have have desires that are contrary to who God originally made us and who we've been who we've been made new in in Jesus. And so we're every day we're called to pick up our cross and follow Christ. And every day we're to set aside our desires and bring them to the obedience of Jesus. And so as soon as I start desiring things that aren't in accordance with who, uh, with who Christ is and the desires that he wants me to have, uh, I start doing battle with those things. The second we start saying, well, this is just okay. I don't really need to be engaging with spiritual battle here. I don't think you're going to experience real transformation. The Bible does promise that God brings, we're to be transformed through the renewing of our mind. Now that's a lifelong process, but to write off that, well, it's okay. Well, what, what person who is struggling with this sin, with these attractions is going to start engaging with spiritual battle. If you just say it's okay on that level, you, you won't. It also, to me, it seems like it, it's sort of a subtle attack on the scripture too, because um, 
you have to be saying like for what she said to, to be true, it, it would mean that there's these people God created that he never gave any instructions to. He wrote this whole book and he right. has so many commands for husbands and wives and even for single people. And, but there's like no category for them. He just like left them out. Like right. to me, like their whole gripe is that the church like leaves us out. And and now, but their argument in favor of not being left out is that, well, the Bible leaves us out. Like, it's just right. Right. Like, like that would seem to reinforce the whole point. Like that's, it, it's not in accord with God's design. He didn't have to address it because it's like, if you had a cookbook that was the gluten-free cookbook and you're like, well, there's no gluten dishes in there. It's like, right. right because Right, it's a gluten-free cookbook. Yeah. <laughs> so. so, so to your point, I was after one of the meetings I had with uh, Calvary, New Mexico. Um, I was encouraged if I wanted to have a real understanding of what the book was saying, that I would need to reach out to Greg Coles myself so that he could explain himself. Now, Good. I don't think I, I think it's clear as day. Just you read it; it's there. But so I they're actually, saying his book doesn't make sense is what they're saying. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I did reach out to Greg Coles and I just wanted to say to your, to your point, yeah. um, uh, it, it, there, there is at one point I was stressing and writing back, communicating over Facebook messenger with them. Like, so do you think that bisexuality, homosexuality, all these orientations existed before the fall in a holy and good way? And then just after the fall, it uh, became corrupted. And he always just, he's always skirting around the issue. So yeah. his response back to me was, uh, there's a point at which I think we're being undeniably speculative in the ways we talk about pre-lapsarian, pre-fall realities. Uh -huh. And that's why this section in single gay Christian is framed in terms of questions rather than answers. And I would say false, false teaching always creeps in through questioning half god said yes yes exactly that's it's, it's like from the beginning you question what god has revealed as plain and true and that's what allows false ideas to come in and he says but i don't think there's any definitive truth that can be offered biblically as to precisely how we ought to understand a pre-fall state i just disagree i think it's very clear like god has given us sufficiently enough in genesis to understand when god created man and when he created woman, he created them so that they would be attracted towards each other. And, and, the, and that would be designed to facilitate marriage and and filling the earth and all of these things. You would, you would never walk away from just a plain reading of scripture going, well, I guess we got to speculate about, I mean, maybe there was all these things before the fall. No, it's, it's so clear. He's given us all we need for life and godliness. Mm -hmm. There's a sufficient understanding of who we are as image bearers, how he created us male and female and the direction that that ought to move towards. But he also goes on to say, uh, I certainly don't think my pre-fall sexuality would have been heterosexual, heterosexuality being fallen as it is. I just want you to see some of the confusing language that comes in. Mm. But it also wouldn't have been homosexual for the exactly the same reason. As to whether I might have been or uh, ordained towards marriage or towards holy singleness in my pre-lapsarian state, that is purely imaginative question that I'm happy to ask without ever knowing the answer to. It does seem to me that some aspect of what we now post-lapsarian experience as sexual orientation might be somewhat akin to personality types in the sense that there can be morally neutral differences in people's disposition. I go, no, that, this is not true at all. Uh, but even there, I'd want to speak. Here's here's the real key to undermining the sufficiency of scripture. Even there, I'd want to speak observationally and speculative to here's what seems and his mind here's what seems to be true based on our current experience and evidence rather than categorically based on some definitive statement of biblical anthropology and i would just go well bingo that's where we we differ i would want to make what i understand on a definitive understanding of what the bible reveals about who we are anthropologically as image bearers those that were created in his image Greg Coles is content to go, well, we have to speculate. And here's what we know based upon our current experience and what social sciences are currently telling us. So those things carry more authority than what the scripture has. And that's that really is what's behind driving uh, the, the gay celibate theology. There's a there is a, they, there is not 
there, the, the view is that scripture does not speak sufficiently to this issue. And so we can, we're kind of free to speculate about some of this stuff here. If we were in any other time, this would be cuckoo. Like people right. would just think this is crazy that someone's advocating this, but because we're in this political environment where there's so much pressure on Christians to just not just tolerate, but celebrate this sin. Right. I think that that's the only reason that this stuff kind of gets any airplay, but all right. So here's uh, the last part of this uh, podcast from Calvary, Calvary Chapel uh, Global Network. There are many Christians that are still on the fence and they would feel like to say you can be gay and be Christian is like blasphemy. But it's mm -hmm. like, what are we actually saying when we say that? We're talking about somebody who is experiencing the attraction, not necessarily somebody who's living it out. And when we're so concerned with controlling the conversation and making sure that people only talk about it in the terms that we want them to, we're never going to make any progress in helping people. Have you faced criticism from Christians who are like, no, like what you're doing, Brenna, isn't enough until you get to the point where you no longer have that attraction. Like you're not, you're not okay. Like you have to, you have to get to that point where that's gone or, or it, it doesn't count. Have you dealt with people who've kind of had that mentality? I've, I've had minimal conversations with people who would say, no, I think attraction is still a sin. Mm. And most of the time that's in like, passing or internet situations where I'm like, man, I don't really feel like I need to dig further into this. Yeah. But. Like, okay. So I guess I, I included those clips to just show the sort of condescension they have towards people who would challenge these right. ideas. They're trying to control the conversation. Their opinions don't matter. Uh, and that would be you. <laughs> yeah. Pastor well, Mike. And, and, and it's the, the sad thing is, is, is like um, those that would hold to, I think just a biblical view that that there are attractions that we have that are just sinful that arise from our fallen nature of the flesh that the Bible commands us to to mortify them, to put them to death, to take these thoughts and bring them to the obedience of Christ. That's just normal Christian living. And and so um, again, they're they're saying, hey, this is, uh, it's okay to be gay because you're just, that's what you experience. And so this is who you are. Instead of taking what scripture says about who we are, who we now are in Christ and living by, by that reality. My, my sin nature is no longer to define who I am. Do I still wrestle with it uh, in a practical fashion because I haven't attained to perfection yet? Absolutely. I mean, Paul hadn't attained yet. We haven't attained yet, but I'm going to continue to press on. And part of that pressing on is taking every thought to the obedience of Christ. And what is disheartening um, is now with the conservative evangelical church adopting a gay celibate theology and same sex attraction as, as okay and not sinful and that you can be a gay Christian, that's an acceptable personhood category that can be attached to being a Christian. When, when those of us that want to stand on what the scripture is saying about our new identity in Christ and what we're supposed to do with the desires of the flesh, what happens is I can try to do it in the most loving way possible. And, and I would, surely I would want to reach out compassionately, let people know what Christ has done for them. And anyone who would be struggling with these sins and these desires in the church, I want to stand with you and help you. You know, I'll pray with you. I, I don't think the answer is let me come out of the closet and embrace this identity. The answer is I need, I need help bearing, like, let me go to my brother in Christ and ask for prayer. And, and here's what's happening. And you could be a little bit vulnerable and say, I need help. Just like I would with other lusts and other sins that would happen in my life, other wrong desires. I say, you know what? I've noticed this pattern. I'm desiring these things that are wrong. Would you please pray for me and start getting the help you need? Mm -hmm. But if the, if the church on a whole starts to adopt this, this theology, it's actually going to make it even harder. The world already thinks Christians hate everybody. We're just bigots and hate people. We can, we don't, we don't think Jesus really loves them. I'm like, no, Jesus died for everyone. He wants everyone to repent. And yeah, it's a horrible, it is a horrible 
a horrible sin. And, uh, and I don't want to make any qualms about it. It is an abomination. The scripture makes that clear. But Jesus died for every horrible sin. And if you turn to him, he's willing to make you new in him. And so if the church adopts this, it just makes any church that stands against it, I think, look yeah, look more hateful. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. There was a, a girl recently who had like a huge OnlyFans account. She just got saved. I don't know if you heard the story, but uh, so she was basically like a, a, a porn, porn star, I guess. And but now she's a Christian. And mm -hmm. you know what Christians did? I mean, she's she's been pretty much welcomed. I mean, she's been like it's been celebrated from what I've seen. Christians are mm -hmm. saying they're not shaming her. Maybe there's a few you know, kooks on the right. fringe or something. Right, but right. like in general, Christians are saying, praise God. You know, another one is just like me. I was saved. She's saved. And um, yeah, I think so. those who are listening who might be like have a, an ax to grind with the church, like, yeah, I mean, there, there's Christians who do bad things. We're sinners, you know, uh, right. not everyone who's even calls themselves Christian is a Christian. But like the, the general, like most Christians, true Christians that's how they behave. That's how Jesus is. He welcomes right. uh, even the prostitute, right? Who repents. So, um, so, okay. So maybe switching gears a little bit here real quick. So um, I, I mentioned this to you uh, this morning, I noticed, or this afternoon, rather, uh, Megan Basham and Preston Sprinkle were kind of going at it. And, and really, this is what it came down to. This guy named, I, I guess it's Tim Whitaker, he is a self-described uh, transgender person, I guess. So, um, and he's speaking at this conference, uh, Theology in the Raw. It's called Exiles in Babylon is the name of the conference. Uh, trans identifying speaker. So that's how I guess she describes him. And then so Preston Sprinkle mocks her and says, wait until she finds out. I also have a Catholic speaking and a Democrat and, and a Palestinian speaking. And he might have, have a thing or two to say about the American empire. And, uh, and then for the, you know, they just get into it and it's just like, he mocks her. He just makes light of it. And, and she's saying, are you, you going to like call this guy out as a false teacher? And, you know, of course he's not. So that's like a small sample of, I guess, the kind of thing that you're going to get at right. this ex uh, exiles in Babylon conference. Now, here's the thing, this conference, for those who know, um, who don't know, this isn't at like a public, it's not like at a town hall. They didn't rent a room somewhere to do just like a, a like, like I don't understand like at a university you have like maybe a couple different views presented on a subject or that's not what this is. This is actually held at Calvary Chapel, Boise, and it's been held there for the last uh, well, since since it's begun in 2021 every year, uh, including this year, this conference is hosted at Calvary Chapel in Boise, Idaho. And it's this Calvary Chapel is not part of the what we were just listening to as part of the uh, global network. This is actually part of the Calvary Chapel Association, the more conservative one. And right. so they're not part of global network, part of this association. And they've been hosting this. And, and so I just thought like I was like, that's really weird. You know, that's that's interesting to me that because th this would seem to be at the very least like violating something in there statement of faith or their what did you call it calvary chapels got what do they uh, call the, them the, the calvary distinctives and i think you know the calvary distinctives uh coming out you know uh decades ago this is not the fight the church was in right you know at that time now we're at a spot where i would just say false doctrine and heresy has always pushed the church towards greater clarity to what it's always taught. So that when, you know, the, the denial that, that Jesus was God in human flesh is pushing for certain councils to come together. And now we need to make a creed to go, no, this is, this is what this, this is what we've taught all along. This is what the scripture clearly says. And so false doctrine, false doctrine arises, this deception comes in to uh, pervert the path that that Christians are upon, the way that we've always been taught. And so false doctrine and heresy has always driven greater clarity. I just think we're at a spot where right. this particular doctrine with, it's like there was no need to do anything when it was just side A. We just completely affirm homosexual marriage. Two people can get two guys can get married and that, and we call that Christianity. Well, I think 
Well, the, were the distinctives enough to deal with that? Certainly, yeah. But now when we're talking about same-sex attraction, not being sin, you can be gay and be a Christian. Like a you, you have to have person preach or, or give spiritual right. instruction at your church. Like that seems like a no brainer to me, right. but I guess. Yeah. I think in all these books too, when I think I was having um, a trans, a trans Christian speak at this conference, what Preston's uh, a newer book uh, he wrote called Embody that deals with like transgenderism. Every so reading Greg Cole's book, reading Preston's book, Embodied, checking out other resources that uh, Preston has put out, everything's always couched like, let me show you how complicated and how hard and difficult yeah, it I've is to wrestle. That about it's, him. it's always that well, way. The, the very limited exposure I've had. I've listened to, I haven't listened to a lot of him, but I, I all, always pick up on that with him. Yeah, all, it's always that. And then, and then he'll land, like in his book, Embodied, he'll land at spots where you go, so do you see I land at this orthodox position? I, I he, Preston will freely say that he thinks that your gender is tied to your biologically created body. And we would go, well, I agree with that. But what he does to subtly move the line is he goes, it's so, listen to these guys, listen to how hard this is, their experience that's so difficult. Do you see even how they read certain texts? And it's just, it's like, uh, you know, uh, predestination versus free will, infant baptism or, or baptizing adults. Like the churches, we've had disagreements over stuff like that. We've been able to walk together. Well, we need to be able to walk together on, on issues like this. And so then, even though you read through his book Embodied, and there's several things in there that are just problematic, he ends like each chapter at a spot where you go, well, I guess he's landing in a right spot. And then at the end of the book, he pushes for we should use pronoun hospitality. Um, mm. If someone's really struggling with this, then then we need to use pronoun hospitality. Entertain their delusion. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Right. Unfortunately, like I think you and I just see that the, the same way. It's like, I don't want to lie to this person about who God has actually made them. Like they're deceived. Their felt reality isn't in accordance with yeah. reality, with truth. What what the Bible says about who they are and who they're to be in Christ. And so when I look at other ministries that, that Preston has influenced and in particular, like posture shift, uh, yeah, there's a, yeah. a, 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 a lady on there, uh, Leslie, I forget her last name, but, but she's like, I'm a transgender. She's a transgender person with the pronouns. They, uh, she uses again and again, well, in, in the book, his book embodied, he speaks about Leslie and he talks in his book about how um, if you use her biological pronoun, she, uh -huh. it, it basically causes her to be undone and she, she stresses out and has all these issues. And, and so we don't want to do that to her. We need to continue to keep using the pronoun they. And, and now this person is a ministry leader at Posture Shift. And in my mind, I just thought, we're not helping this, this yeah. lady. We're not helping her at all. And why would I have someone leading a ministry that comes undone if you just use the proper pronoun to refer to who she is? I go, if she has no stability in Christ to move forward and embrace who God has really made her, why is she leading in a ministry mm -hmm. saying, oh, well, you know, I, I seem unstable entertain. or immature. Or, right. Yeah, has issues that need to be worked through. It's, so you see, they say one, they say, we're orthodox on this hand and try to make strong cases, but then you see the way it's, it's, it's laid out. I go, this is crazy. Is posture shift connected to Calvary in any way or. Uh, so I, I, to be honest, I don't know. I look at, okay. All right. I look at the center. I, I can have it. Center for wrong. biblical sexuality. I think they call yeah, it. Yeah. The it's center for yeah. faith, faith, sexuality, and gender, which faith is run by by uh, Preston Sprinkle and the senior research fellow is Greg Coles. And if you look at their endorsements, you're be, it's like Francis Chan endorses them. Um, yeah. um, uh, Matt Chandler endorses them. I read the, fr the front of the book embodied and I go, Sean McDowell endorses it. I go, this is I, the amount Sean of McDowell. People. Really? Yes. Uh, yeah. That's disappointing. I, and, and so these are people that I actually, that, that, I've gleaned a lot from, you know, over the years and in, in particular areas. 
That's so especially so when I see Sean McDowell, I would go, I, I would never even imagine that he would put a stamp of approval on the book embodied, especially when it ends with conclusions yeah. that we should use pronoun hospitality he, and things like that. You know, though, I, I've noticed that this is maybe a rabbit trail I don't want to get too deep into, but like the higher you get in these schools and conference circuits and churches and, and denominations, like the more pressure that there is to conform to what everyone else is doing. And Sean is in all the guys you actually just mentioned are in highly pressurized environments. And uh, like, I remember a few years ago, I had I private messaged Sean McDowell because he had shared something from Jude three project. And I pointed out that Jude three project has promoted blatant heresy mm. at times. And he actually like reached out and it, it, he, he thanked me actually. Um, he right. did not put a retraction out there. I think he just deleted it. It right. would have been nice, right? If he retracted it. Sure, but, sure. Like, um, but you know, since then, I know like he, he's at what school is he at? Um, he's at Talbot. Uh, he's at Talbot, but it's all, but he's also uh, a professor, isn't he? At it's, uh, it's, uh, it's Loyola, is it Loyola? Loyola. And their it's, seminary is Talbot in Loyola. Is, I think okay. that might be how no, it is. It, where, wherever, well, I should probably, or Bi Biola, Biola, not Biola. Loyola. Not Loyola. Yeah, is it? Lo yeah. I think that's what that one's Catholic. <laughs> so yeah. Biola. Biola. Um, but you know, like I, I know Ed Stetzer's there now in a prominent position. He's super woke, in my right. opinion, for evangelical standards, that is. Uh, yeah. you know, Matt Hall, who was pushing critical race theory stuff at Southern Seminary, right. he's there. I think he's like their their dean or president or something. So like and Pre Preston Sprinkle comes out of Biola and Talbot. Oh, he does. Yeah. Really? So there's yeah, I I think I that's thought he was a master he... seminary guy. Maybe he's both. Uh, maybe I so I guess uh, maybe I should be wrong from, You're all from remember, California. That's that's the <laughs> lesson here. Yeah. <laughs> but but from what I remember, uh, he he got his his PhD uh, through Biola. And so then I see okay. these guys and, and it could be like, uh, look, at there's there's something that you there's statements people could put out that you 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 realize like years later, they realize no, I don't side with this. I don't agree with this. Sean McDowell might not, he might not agree with it now. He might say, no, I, I realize there's something amiss here. And I yeah. wish I never would have endorsed uh, the beginning of the book embodied. I don't think uh, he's Biola. Just, just to clarify, I, I, it says on his website, Aberdeen university. And oh, then he, ta okay. he taught at Cedarville and oh, okay. Okay. I don't know, but so either way, but no, um, well, I appreciate so, that. I don't want to be spreading. I, I don't need to be spreading falsehood and, and speculation. See there. what I you're just doing noticed. here, Pastor Mike. That's right. Like, see what it's a doing. problem. It's uh, I can see why they were concerned about you. Um, so uh, I guess the final thing, I mean, we don't have to go through all of this. There's actually one particular part that I wanted to play. But the reason I wanted to just show show this is uh, this is a video of two of the pastors at Calvary Chapel, Boise which is, like I said, in the more conservative association. Mm -hmm. And pre and so this isn't just press and sprinkles, like renting their building so he can do like, I, 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 we would disagree with that. But he, but it's that's at least let more detached. This is like their endorsement, in my opinion, like this is it, it's a sign that they're getting that the controversies formed, they're getting pushback. And so they did this podcast, I think this was about a month ago with Preston, to just basically say, we're going to be doing this conference with the trans trans identifying speaker and, and others. And, and we're supportive of it. And so, um, so here's Preston Sprinkle with the two pastors. What we do is we value, um, healthy, diverse thought. Mm -hmm. Um, we don't, you know, we don't, uh, we're not going to put someone on stage to, to tell us some kind of heretical view. Or even if we do have somebody share their viewpoints, we're going to have somebody else with a, with with another viewpoint and mm -hmm. see them dialogue with each other. Um, we have lots of what I call dialogical debates. So not that angry kind of debating, but like a genuine dialogue. Mm -hmm. We have d people with different perspectives, and they're going to engage each other. And we're going to do a lot more conversations. So a lot of the talks are only like 15 minutes, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but then if it is a controversial topic, I, I typically want to get both sides represented. So we're doing a whole pre-conference this year on the theology and politics of Israel Palestine. Mm. Even as I say that, people like, listening yeah, people are like, wait, 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 wait. wait. So wait a second. We, I have four people coming. Two are going to be more sympathetic with the Israel side and two are going to be more sympathetic with the Palestinian side. Mm -hmm. 
nobody's sympathetic with Hamas, just to be yeah, <laughs> clear. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, you got a lot of, you know, civilian casualties in Israel's response. And some people are saying that that's kind of something we really need to talk about. And other people are like, yeah, but look at what Hamas did to Israel. And and they're, they're, it's a, the one thing we can all agree on, it's super complex. Mm-hmm. So let's get together. <laughs> there, there it is. There, there's the, yeah. uh, the yeah. but, you know, it's funny when Megan called him out this, this afternoon, he didn't say, oh, no, you don't understand. We're having a debate. There's someone that's going to debate this this other speaker who's trans identifying. Like he didn't say that. He just mocked her. Mm. It's uh, it, it's I don't know. It, it's like it, it's strange. Like I guess if you're going to debate, like refute, we're having this person in because we disagree with them. We're going to sure. refute him. But that's not what it, it, he he's. I, I don't really know what's going on in there exactly. Uh, like like sp- specifically. But I, what I do know is that the there are these these speakers that claim to be Christians. That are right. then they're in a church. They're giving spiritual instruction, and they're not coming in as an outside guest. Like he's not saying like we're having an atheist today to debate. Like they're coming in as brothers, and like that's how they're treated. I know that. Right. Right. So, yeah. I don't know if you had anything. I I just I had to stop it there. So. Well, I I think you're, um, you're hitting the nail on the head by pointing out like. Hey, this is a con- there's complicated stuff. Everything's always presented as complicated, and then and then we need to figure out some way to have unity on these complicated issues. When in all reality, I go okay. Look, if there's you know the, the the different stripes of eschatology, as I've heard you put it in certain things. Like, oh, of course, I can have unity on stuff like that. But when we're talking about essential things about who we are in Christ and who we're designed to be in Christ and how the Bible talks about engaging war with our flesh. Uh, this, this is something that we we should not be as pastors aiming to, to bring in something that, that shows that this is complicated and hard and we need to figure out some, some sympathetic way to allow people to have these attractions of their flesh and 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 be okay with it or like and, these are all valid uh yeah, positions or that something. they're all equally valid it's so to your point one, one of the other things i i in my engagement with greg coles uh over facebook messenger i asked i never got a response back but it had to do with preston sprinkles actually calling those on side a uh um brothers in christ uh he calls in his his uh, video series on sexuality in the Bible in session 13, uh, he's, he talks about the whole thing is how we relate to those who disagree. And Preston calls both Justin Lee and Matthew Vines who affirm, they affirm homosexual marriage, gay marriage as being fine for Christians uh, to do, which mm-hmm. obviously we know scripture doesn't teach that. And Preston is, is saying he believes scripture doesn't teach that. But he refers to them as brothers, Wow! even in that video. And I thought, well, that's odd. What? So I asked Greg Coles, do you think it's appropriate that we call Justin Lee and Matthew Vines brothers, even though they presently and actively and currently endorse uh, monogamous same-sex marriage? Would you agree with Preston Sprinkles that Justin Lee and Matthew Vines should be called brothers in Christ? Mm-hmm. And I actually never got a response back. Yeah. And, and so that's kind of, that's where it ends up heading. It heads to like, to that type of stuff. Yeah. I mean, he's in the example he picks here. Like, I mean, I have my opinions on that conflict and uh, you know, and it's funny. He, he, he's like, Oh, no one would be with Hamas, which I would wonder if he was here, I'd want to ask him like, why, like, why, like, aren't all right. ideas like, shouldn't we have a zesty debate? Why not have someone who's pro Hamas, you know, if you're, but uh, like, that's that whole issue is not, in the same category as fundamentally are there other genders outside of the right you know yeah it's different email like it's just it, it's like you could have your opinions and still be a christian on these things and uh and be i guess within orthodoxy even though you might be wrong in my opinion but like but but this is yeah i don't know he's paralleling something too and i think that adds to the confusion of, of like this is controversial and so is this yeah but they're different types of controversies um, anyway, gather and talk about it. Mm-hmm. Um, we've got a session on uh, politics, mm-hmm. and again, right there, people are like, "Oh, what do you got to promote?" Well, we have three Christian approaches to politics. All of them are solid on the gospel. All of them are Bible believing evangelicals, but there one's go, yeah. kind of 
slightly more left leaning, one's slightly more right leaning. Um, not not to the not to the extremes. In mm-hmm. fact, they're all pro life. Even the even the left leaning one's pro life. Um, and then we have somebody who's kind of more of a. I think all parties are <laughs> garbage, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but they're going to give their talks, give their 15 minute presentation. But then we're going to see them engage in an hour long conversation with each other, and the audience can ask questions. So. Mm-hmm. Here's the key to the conference is I want people to come in uncomfortable. Mm. Like you have to come in and you have to think through the different perspectives. You cannot just sit there and passively absorb a bunch of talks that you already agree with. There's Mm -hmm. conferences that do that. Mm -hmm. There's a place for that. I've gone to those, you know, Mm -hmm. where you go and you get encouraged by people you already know are like – you know, line up with you on everything. You know, this conference is 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 not like that. It's almost like a has like almost like a TED talk kind of element to it, where you're going to hear different perspectives, and you're you're going to be forced to say, okay, which aspect do I think is right and wrong, and why? And you're going to be forced to ask yourself those those questions. Mm-hmm. So. Attraction and lust are not the same thing. No, and I think that should be obvious. And uh, <clears throat> when I was preaching, I used the example of my all time biggest Hollywood crush, which is Audrey <laughs> Hepburn. I just I, I'm <laughs> Yeah, yeah, Pastor Mega, like, like, just I'm just like saying for everyone out there, including you, like, like, listen to this example. This is like, this clip is so weird to me. But anyway, uh, let's play it, and then, then I want to get your opinion on it's cool. it. I, yeah, she's, <laughs> but she's cool so. Guy. I'm a big movie guy. <laughs> I, she's so cute to me, like, and I'm, I'm so attracted to her. I, in no meaningful way have I ever that I can think of <laughs> lusted or felt guilty about my thoughts. Like, yeah. she's beautiful. She's just beautiful. Yeah. I'm attracted to her. Yeah. Um, and. And I also in just, a way that's different than you is saying Brad Pitt's a handsome guy. Exactly, very different. It's still different. <clears throat> yeah. Even though one, either no, you're not less than after either one. Either one. The term attraction yeah. is yeah. Yeah, and that's because I am attracted to women, and yeah. that fact is not lust is not lust right. either. Right. It's just a fact that I'm attracted to women. Right. So it's like I think we it's very important that we make this distinction. Because I think people get these distinctions confused in their in their minds. So it's like they hear you come out and say, "Look, I I I hold to a traditional biblical ethic. I believe marriage is supposed to be between a man and a woman, and and that is the only place where sexuality is is supposed to be." And then in their minds they say, "Yeah, but what about your thoughts and your lustful sure, life and yeah. that stuff?" And so yeah. I think you know, yes, lust is wrong. Also, I didn't mean to, to no go no on that, Th- thoughts and feelings and desires they they can be sinful yes. for sure. But then we also have have temptations that aren't in and of themselves sin until we act on that. Mm-hmm. Tucker and I are, are married. We're both heterosexual. We're both attracted to the opposite sex. That means we're, like you, attracted to 4 mm-hmm. billion people on the planet. Yeah. <laughs> but it's like, well, yeah, but it doesn't mean like I'm desiring to yeah. have mm-hmm. sex with, mm-hmm. you know, it's just like a general category. Mm-hmm. So gay people, I'll just say mm-hmm. people who are gay or same-sex attracted, it's the same thing. And I'm fine saying maybe the difference would be opposite sex attraction in the sense we're talking about it. You know, that that's a natural part of our, you know, that's like Genesis 1 and 2, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Whereas same-sex attraction might be part of the fall. I'm totally fine with that. I think that's yeah. probably the best theological explanation. But not everything that's part of fallen nature is itself is, an, is, is like a morally culpable sin to repent from. I mean, all disabilities are probably yeah. part of the fall. I, I've mean thought of that exact yeah. same connection. Same-sex attraction. Okay, okay, all right. <laughs> Got to stop what there. A, that's a poor example. That, that's that's a-, a mess. Yeah, so it was such a poor example. There's a lot to kind of unpack there, but I think one, that's a poor example to start talking about some of the suffering, ongoing ramifications of the fall with disease, thorns, thistles, things like that. If someone's born with a deformity, of course, that is not a, a morally culpable sin. Jesus makes that clear for sure. And and uh and the only reason those exist is because sin has entered the world. There's people that are born blind, people born with deformities. And that doesn't mean that they're morally culpable for, uh, you know, violating God's uh, moral order, that they're actively sinning from their heart. Jesus says it's not the stuff that comes from the outside that defiles. It's what comes from within, evil thoughts. So once we get into spots where we're dealing with thoughts, this is different. Attractions, desires, those things are evil and they defile us. And so I, I, it's a convoluted mess because now you're hearing, uh, I think the argument has gotten progressively more deceptive down the road. Um, so I, I can hear Preston say, I think that same-sex attraction is probably a result of the fall. I think that's the best explanation. So he says that I think it is the explanation 
for sure. It's not probably, it is the explanation. And those attractions and desires are there as a direct result of the fall. But you start looking at the circles that Preston hangs out with and you pick up, I mean, he's still, uh, because he works right side by side with Greg Coles, they're still promoting single gay Christian. And Greg Coles is speculating. They want to speculate. Is this part of a, a good part of who we are? There's a holy way to conduct these things and to live this out. But but to start using an example of a normal attraction the way God designed it, men attracted to women, women attracted uh, to men, and then to somehow say, well, that same type of attraction, uh, as long as you're not lusting or desiring to be with them sexually, if that's happening towards the same sex, that it's it's equally not sin. I would say it, that's wrong. It's categorically wrong. It's it's missing the original design that God placed into creation. And it, you would never go, I mean, to your point, again, just throw another example in there, put some other, uh, put some other desire in there. You would not say for a minor attracted, like I'm a minor attracted person. I'm attracted to little kids. I'm not lusting after them, but I am attracted to them in this unique way. And that's going to help me do like kids ministry. That's crazy. You would never do that with dog. Like I'm attracted to dogs. I uh, now we're, we're now we're going even further away from created order. You, you wouldn't say, that this is a normal, okay desire to have. That's a corrupted desire from the flesh. And, and when Preston starts talking about sinful desires, evil desires, I, I, we can have desires that are sinful. And I would just say, well, sin is the, 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 just means to miss the mark. And in Romans chapter three, it says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So I would say, what is sin? Sin is anything that fails to glorify God. So if I have thoughts that fail to glorify him, that fail to honor the way that he's designed and operated for us to, to move in, then that thought that I have is a sin. You know, this, is, this, is, this misses the mark of glorifying God in my, in my desires. And so because of that, that's something that I should repent of. That's something that I should turn away from and go, God, what, why is that even help, help me to turn? And maybe that's something someone has struggled with on an ongoing basis where I go, you just keep doing it all the time, keep bringing it to the Lord. And I do believe in progressive sanctification and that there's hope and there could be real change. I mean, for someone who, who had come out of bondage to like uh, lust and pornography and these other things as an unbeliever, um, God has transformed my thinking. I don't have those thoughts, those desires to the same intensity that I did. Do I still battle with them? Yeah, sure. I, I, I battle with those things, but God has given me victory in these areas, and I will continue to keep pushing forward in progressive sanctification. And the same is true for someone that would have uh, same-sex desires as well. You would just continue. I would encourage, like, continue to keep bringing it to the Lord. God's grace is sufficient, and He can help you. And guess what? Your same-sex desires, uh, they shouldn't be the primary thing that defines you. And I know that they, side B says that, but it's treated differently. It's still treated as something that defines who that person is. I don't know if I answered all, kind of all. That was was good. No, that was good, uh, because yeah, I mean, I think you're you're getting at the main um, issue with that, which is like, so I don't know if you noticed, like they they did some equivocation. So you heard um, the, the pastor, I don't know his name, talking about Audrey Hepburn and yeah. his his feelings of Audrey about Audrey Hepburn, and and really like he clumsily, I think I think the whole thing was clumsy. They're not using precise words, but he's talking about noticing her beauty. That's what I got from that. Like he's, right. he's noticing she's someone that he considers attractive in, in, in the sense that she has a beautiful face and, and a smile. And we even talk about that. Like we'll say attractive personalities and we don't sure. necessarily mean that we're lusting after that person in a sexual way. We just, they're the kind of person you like being around. Right. Right. Um, so, so he's talking about that. And then it, uh, Preston Sprinkle says, he uses the same word attraction 
to say, well, I'm attracted to half the population of earth, which I'm thinking like, that's you're using attraction in a totally right. different way. Then that's, that's not the same thing. You're talking about suitability now that God has made design men for women. Mm. Right. Like, it, and well, he's not talking about, I guess he's, he's saying that because he's heterosexual, you know, half the, the women of the world or whatever. And, and then they want to like get those two things away from lust. So, so like Preston Sprinkle, like downplays even like the example the pastor gives. Cause he's like, Oh, I can be attracted without sinning. And then Preston Sprinkle's like, well, attraction, like, it's like, you don't even have to meet the right. person. Apparently you could be attracted to them. You know, they're just some per person of the opposite gender and they want to stick like SSA in that, in those categories somewhere. Like right. same sex attraction is hiding within liking Audrey Hepburn's face or it's hiding or noticing it's beautiful or it's hiding within like this suitability, you know, feature that God's put into us that, and and so like it's like anything to make sure that it's not in the category of sin, which is where scripture puts it. I think that's what you're exactly. saying too. Yeah, exactly. But um it, it's the word games and, and the lack of precision. I I don't I don't want to be cynical, you know, and <laughs> say like that's like part of their deception that's been thought out before they did the discussion. But it's like right. it does seem to me like that lack of precision is it makes it sound more complex than it actually is. Scripture makes this, right. it's a simple right. issue in the Bible, right? right. So I, I think at the end of the day, when it comes to the sufficiency of scripture being under attack, is uh, this is, it's me making assumptions. So maybe I, I'm, I'm skewing their motives, but uh, the, the personhood of, of, of being gay, uh, being trans, like those are valid categories in their mind based on experience and what we're starting to know by uh, social as you know social sciences and things like this that this it should be a real category of of personhood you just can't act on these things in action but this kind of defines who you are so this should be an accepted category of personhood the church needs to bring in. And if the church is willing to do this, now, now the world's going to see just how loving and charitable and kind that we are. In a lot of ways, I think it's, it's that misguided notion uh, that is driving it. It's like we, we, have, to, yeah. we have to continue to allow this, this, this uh this category of personhood to be acceptable and in and, and church, if you could just embrace it to me, it's like the conservative church sees side a side a as too big of a step. Uh, you know, it's like that. No, that's off. We don't buy that side B comes along and, and they, it's like, it's off, but let us just give you another step. You'll take this one. And it's just the next step oh, that's on a good over. A, a, analogy. Yeah. Yeah. Cause, cause uh, you know, the more I think about it, like if you put, cause what they're really saying, without saying it directly is that like, if you like, if you think Audrey Hepburn is pretty like and, and great and uh, Preston Sprinkle said, well, that, and you notice her in ways you wouldn't notice guys. Right. Like, so right. you're there's there to flip that the art. Cause the argument they're making is that a guy can do that with other guys. Like you, you could be a guy who notices other guys and is attracted in, in a way that you wouldn't be though to women. And that's like perfectly fine. Cause it's not technically lust. Or you can be wired in such a way from the fall, apparently, right. that you are attracted in in a suitable sense to like half the population, but they're also your your gender, right? And and those two things would also be off limits because in in, in the first case, when you you're, you can, I mean, I'm not saying you can't notice that another guy's uh, a good looking guy or or someone sure. that you know you like to hang out. Scripture with be Scripture does it. Like God talks right. about Saul. Well, he was, he was handsome and he was head and shoulders, yep. you know, above all the rest. It talks yeah, about yeah. that with females too. It's Absolutely. like, yeah, there's, there's objective beauty. Someone can objectively be a handsome guy or we all notice that girl. stuff. Yeah, yeah, sure. Sure. But, but, but as soon as you start saying like, and it's, it, it's like part of my identity that I only notice guys and I'm only attracted to guys yeah. as a man and not females and that's like part of my homosexual inclination or same-sex attraction or whatever right. and it's not sin because it's not lust you're still you're still admitting that there's a like you're out of step with god's design for you right at a fundamental level right and and if you start saying i'm suitable like i have this attraction to like all men 
you know, in this general sense, like you're, it, it's just, it, it's like, uh, 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 just uh, like a hide and go seek kind of game. Like you're, you're just taking it that is. and you're trying to move it to different places where it's like, okay, right. they attacked it when we said it was this and now let's put it over here deeper and maybe they won't find it yeah. if we put yeah, it over it here. Is. It, 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 you know? it is. Like, it's like a, a theological clamshell game. Yeah. And we can just move it around. Whack-a-mole. And, and yeah. And then now, now do you see, and do you see where we, we we believe an Orthodox view of sexuality and marriage? Do you see that? And at the end of the day, you just have to go, no, I, I don't think anyone just, if you were to just pick up your Bible and just read it, if you were to just pick up your Bible and just read Genesis, there's no way you would walk away going, yeah, I think before the fall, there there was a there's this sort of sexuality, uh, or these you could be this holy single eunuch, like this category of sexuality um, that they want you to yeah. buy into. I, there's you, no way you would do that. Could you imagine if Adam was in the garden and he's just like, you know, Eve's the only other human, and he's like, you know, bummer. I I can yeah. only notice the beauty of other guys. You know, yeah. I'm only attracted to guys. Like, yeah, you know, I like. It's just, it, it's nonsense. Right. So, um, yeah. all right. Anyway, uh, or, or yeah, I, there's much more that could be said. I, do we want to finish? We've been going, this is a long one. Um, yeah, let's just play a, a clip and we'll see if there's anything else. I think we've said a lot, but. Traction as that the cat, the way we described it is not a morally culpable sin that somebody needs to repent from mm -hmm. lust. Yes. Repent. Same sex, sexual behavior. Yes. Repent. Those are absolute sins. But simply being tempted with the same sex is not a morally culpable sin. Just me saying that, that she says I'm a heretic because but, of but that. But you are saying you have to repent of l the yes. actual lust. S from any sinful desire yeah. you yeah. repent yeah. from. Yeah. Okay. Um, now, when she describes same-sex attraction, it just seems like she's describing lust. Mm -hmm. And that's where I just want I think it's just almost like a terminological distinction. If I was saying this is sin and you don't need to repent from that, then yeah, that, that would be heresy. Um, and then the other one is that no Christian should ever use the term gay as a description mm -hmm. of their experience. And that's where I'm going to say language can mean different things to different people. I don't think it's n every time somebody uses the term gay, it means kind of the same kind of I am gay and Jesus mm -hmm. is down here kind of kind of to, sense. To illustrate so. really quickly, I had a friend who recently just referenced a family member who he said, well, I have a family member who's gay. Yeah. That family member <laughs> yeah. is a Christian. That would be heresy. That, that well, but mind. that yeah. family member is a Christian who is practicing celibacy and is right trying to be obedient to God's word and believes that it's wrong to engage. Like, yeah. like, so he just used that description yeah. of the family. It was just it was a shorthand yeah. to explain something that in our culture makes perfect sense. And what he meant mm -hmm. was that that family member uh, believes yeah. struggles with struggles that, with yeah. same sex same sex attraction. attraction. That's what it meant. So I, I have no ill will against uh, Rosaria. Um, appreciated her she her early her first book where she documents her conversion is incredible. She's done great work. She's you know a very smart. Um, but yeah, she has on several occasions um, tried to point out things in my writing, and her interpretation of what I'm saying is, I mean, if I'm honest, it's 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 one of the more bizarre <laughs> interpretations I've seen. So mm -hmm. more recently, she quoted from page 45 of my book, Does the Bible Support Same-Sex Marriage?, in which I give t 21 reasons why the Bible does not support same-sex <laughs> marriage. <laughs> yeah, it's like it's a simple book, really. It's like, no. It's it's a, <laughs> it's a def by definition, it's a defense of the traditional view of marriage. And in the context where I'm giving five arguments for traditional marriage, it's in that context where she takes a little paragraph that I wrote and comes to the conclusion that I don't think gay people need to repent from sin. And I, and, and my whole point, yeah, it, it was just, I'm like, how did the, the, the literal subtitle of that section is the Bible consistently condemns same sex sexual relationships. And she got it from when I was I was looking at, you know, Romans one addresses same sex relationships. And I, I make a statement and she actually misquotes, she leaves out half of a sentence, the part of the sentence that disagreed with her interpretation of my <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then she stopped short of the next line that so she's just cherry picking stuff. Mm -hmm. And she came to the conclusion that Preston doesn't think gay people need to repent from sin. My point was Romans in Romans one, you guys know Romans one. Yep. Mm -hmm. yep. The point in Romans 1 is not just to condemn all the sins in Romans 1. 
it's to show that we all need Jesus. Because like in Romans 1, you have the, the Jew who's sitting there saying, yeah, Paul, you go get him, go get him, go get him. Mm-hmm. And what is he doing 2-1? Mm-hmm. Who are you to judge, yeah. you know? Yeah. Yeah. So he, the whole point is, a, is to say we all need to repent yeah. from sin. Mm-hmm. Yeah. By me saying that, she took that to mean that I don't think gay people need to mm-hmm. repent from sin in a book showing that all sex outside of a male-female marriage are sin that mm-hmm. needs to be repented from. Okay, so I, I perhaps should not have included that because I, I, I'm not familiar with uh, what Rosaria said. I Rosaria Butterfield is who he's referring so, to there. Go ahead. Yeah. No, so me, me too. I, I will say, um, listening to, uh, I, I've, I've appreciated uh, Rosaria Butterfield, you know, coming to a place where uh, she has said, hey, I, I want to publicly repent of using um, categories of, of uh, of personhood that are sinful, like it being okay to say uh, you can be uh, gay and a Christian. Certain other areas, like I, I have to reflect. It's been a while since I read this like public statement that she put out, and since then, her and I, I watched this interview. It was her, Christopher Yuan, mm-hmm. and um, another Beckett Cook. Beckett Cook, yeah, great yeah. is a great great interview about can you be gay and Christian and they're going out of their out of their way. All of these guys are people who would go. We struggled with same sex attraction, and and uh, Beckett Cook and Christopher Yuan would say we still battle with this daily, but God is giving us victory, and we are growing yeah. in sanctification. And, and, and funny enough, all three of them are people. I don't know about Beckett Cook as much. I, I knew a little about him, but uh, like all three are people that I, um, in in perhaps my clumsy way, but I, I went after because I knew something was wrong years ago, right? Like, right? like they were starting to embrace some of this stuff. And they've, from my understanding, I know Rosaria has for sure. Yeah. Um, and she, she's been, she, she's a wonderful encouragement to me. Um, just, she, she's really an amazing person just from the, the limited interaction I've had. But, um, but, but all three of them have, have said, you know what, we were going in a wrong direction. We repented that. And yes. this is, so um, the, the thing is, though, I don't buy what he's saying, I guess. And I don't have to even hear what Rosaria said necessarily, just because I, I do know her well enough to know she wouldn't say to someone, because this is what this is what he wants you to believe, that uh, she wouldn't say, well, you must not want everyone to repent because you're or, or sorry, um, you must think that gay people. That's what he said. You, you must think that homosexuals um, aren't in sin because you believe everyone should repent. Right. That's basically what he wants you to, to think that she believes. Right. Like that makes like I know that she wouldn't say that. that that's like what Christian would like, right. you know, be. And I would I would spe- I would have to spend I have not read everyone the believes- book and I haven't yeah. listened to Rosario. Right. Comment, I know. I know. But I what I do think very clearly is Rosaria and Preston use it. it it's I've heard you say it. Apologists say it all the time. Uh, it, it happens when the social justice movement, when in the church they're promoting social justice, is they use they use the same vocabulary but but a different dictionary. That's that's exactly that, I was go that right is there, what that so, is yep. what is happening. So Rosaria is going to look at these desires, this attraction, and she's going to say that is sin. That's a lo- that is a lust of the flesh, an attraction of the flesh. And those things need to be mortified and crucified. Now, I, I just know that based on some of the other like interviews and things that I've watched her do uh, with uh, Elisa Childers and and stuff like that. And it's very clear where she stands. So Preston does not believe that he says you could go to the, the Center for Faith, Sexuality and Gender. And on their statement on marriage, it will say we we do not believe that being same sex attracted and then in parentheses it says or being gay is a morally culpable sin i was like you don't think that being like the verb of being is there that yeah. being gay is a morally culpable sin it is yeah. th- th- that is a sin that we're culpable for and we'll give an account for and 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 praise the lord he sent his son to die so those things no longer have to define who i am and and I consider myself dead. I consider my my flesh, those desires, they're dead. They died with Christ, and I've been risen to a new way of life, so that those things don't define me. That's where I believe that Rosaria, Christopher Yuan, they're they're going to come at it. And so Preston Sprinkles is going to say, "See, they they say that I don't think you need to repent." Well, you 
or that you don't need to turn from sin. It's that they're defining like where the sin is actually at at two different spots. And and I would say what has happened is the goalpost of of where the Bible says our flesh is and where the real spiritual battle begins and taking every thought captive has been moved further down the road. Yeah. And so now it's down the road. And so if you're experiencing just attractions, don't worry about doing spiritual battle there. That's fine. You're fine. Right. That that part of that, a little bit of your flesh can hang on there. That's OK. But if it, if it starts acting up here now, you need to do something about it. And I go, no, all of it, all of it, the, the whole recipe for your flesh, every attraction, desire, everything is to be crucified. It's considered dead. And mm -hmm. and that's an you and I, every Christian, we all deal with it every day. Yeah, no, good word. And I, I think with Preston to put a cap on it. And I, again, I, I haven't, li I haven't actually read any of his books. Uh, I probably should. Uh, you have, you've read just the one or. Yeah, I've read embodied. Uh, okay. I, I've read most of uh, no longer strangers and, and I've read single gay Christian. That's not Preston. That's Greg Coles, but they're on the same page. The MO is the same in every, in everything. His video yeah, series, like, I watched everything right. is complicated and, and, and so do you see where we're orthodox is really complicated. And so we, we can't come to sound conclusions. Gotcha. No, that's, that's good to sort of demystify, I guess, his tactic. I, I, I think he confuses the issues it seems like, and, and then just kind of like, um, they call it a Mott and Bailey, I guess, but like he, he'll run back to that kind of fortress of like, Hey, look at these orthodox beliefs. But that sort of distracts you from like the, the issue that you're, you know, Hey, you could be totally for traditional marriage, you know, and also think that same sex attraction is perfectly permissible within the Christian life. Like those, yeah. you know, that now I, I think those things are inconsistent, but like, you know, it, it doesn't to, to, to run back to some Orthodox belief you have uh, just shifts the conversation. It's, it's a distraction. So, um, I'll just give you the final word since we, this is probably one of the longer podcasts I've done in a while, mm. uh, but I'm not going to say anything else. Uh, any word you'd have for people maybe still in Calvary yeah. uh, chapels yeah. or whatever. I, I honestly, I think there's a ton of great faithful uh, brothers in Christ that are faithfully shepherding the flock well within Calvary's. And I would say, keep up, keep up the good fight. Keep doing what you're doing. Uh, just be aware that on some level, this stuff is obviously I, it, it was not, but a couple of weeks before we're doing this podcast, I'm finding out Preston Sprinkle actually goes to that Calvary in Idaho. That's where he goes to church. And I said, oh, man. Oh, I, I didn't even know that. OK, I had no idea that that's that's where he he attends church. And so then these conferences are being put on there. That obviously doesn't mean that every Calvary Chapel is doing this, but it's there just like in the Southern Baptist uh, Convention. Right. Stuff is there and there's good guys doing the good fight and hopefully uh, they can turn, steer the ship another direction. I hope that that can happen in, in Calvary's, uh, too. And, um, uh, I really do think it's worthwhile that pastors are aware that this theology is out there and that it's being pushed by some pretty influential guys, Francis Chan, Matt Chandler. So there's a whole new series that's coming out from the center of faith, sex, uh, sexuality, faith, and gender. Um, I might have messed up how those words go in there, but Preston Sprinkle's <laughs> right. organization, uh, there's a new series geared for teens. And I just think of the sway that Francis Chan has on, on a large part of the evangelical church. They're going to see Francis Chan. They're going to see some of these other names and they're going to think, well, this is good. We should show this to the youth as a new way of engaging with, uh, people who are, 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 homosexuals and and how we can help them with this struggle and at the end of the day if the church buys into this you, you're not bringing them the real help and change that can be found in christ you, you leave them at a spot where actually it's like well you're just gonna have to be single forever there's not any hope at all that god could ever change or transform your desires and so uh just you can be gay and be a Christian, just suck it up and be celibate. But also, you know, if, if you, if you're reading something from Greg Coles, it's like, ah, uh, who are we even really to know? You know, we, I mean, maybe you can, 
you can pray and and faithfully come to a conclusion you can enter into gay marriage and still follow yeah. follow jesus who are we to even really judge that stuff that's that's the conclusions that are driven at the end of that book and and so it's going to lead people down a bad path and so i hope i hope people just take heed uh to do what paul said which is just to shepherd the flock and don't fail to declare the whole counsel of god and the thing that paul told the ephesians elders and acts chapter 20 was that uh he said, remember my way of life and what manner I conducted myself and how he taught both Jews and Gentiles that they were to repent and place their faith in Jesus. And I think that's important because what's happening is we're undermining where repentance needs to happen, where you repent and how you anchor your hope in Christ. And so if we, if we fail to teach that, it's going to lead to detriment when it comes to discipleship and evangelism. Well, thank you, Pastor Mike. You can go to redemptionhillnm.com if you want to find out more, and, or .org, I'm sorry, redemptionhillnm.org. Uh, and uh, I'm sure, assuming your email address is there if people want to get in touch with you uh, as well to ask questions or get, get advice. But hey, I really appreciate it, and I'm sure a lot thank of people you. will too. So God yeah, bless. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for all you do, John.